we aren't going to put up with corporate corruption anymore. We aren't going to put up with corporate money in our politics, corporate money around the world, controlling everything, controlling all of our natural resources, controlling all of our lives. There's a lot of people here that realize something's wrong, but they don't know what. These big businesses like Bank of America and Exxon have so much influence over our government, they will never be held accountable until the people stand up and beg for justice. you know, the, um, all of the protests in the Middle East, but we can't, this is happening in our own backyard, you know, and, and why isn't this on TV? Why? There are a bunch of people basically gambling with all of our futures, and uh, I don't agree with that. I don't consent to that. Our politicians no longer represent us, the people. The, the voice of the people has not been heard. These people are out here talking about things that affect everybody. Problems with the banking system, problems with politics, um, my 401k plan, your 401k plan, problems with how that all works. A lot of things are going on, and I think we are in the middle of something going on that's very big. It doesn't look like it's going to end real soon. Because Congress has failed the American people in this mortgage foreclosure situation. And the very large mega banks and all of their emissaries, including MERS, uh, basically march to the tune of about six big banks in the country. And so whether they're servicers, whether they're MERS, it's all connected to the head. Uh, the very large institutions are largely based in New York and Charlotte, North Carolina. And they've taken America for a ride because back in the early 90s, they, uh, when the thrifts collapsed, which were the institutions that financed housing, the commercial banks wanted to do housing. But I said to myself, why? Because the payout is 30 years, whereas normal commercial loans they were used to making is seven years. Well, they figured out they couldn't make as much money with housing, so they decided to hyperinflate it and they, to make more money. And for a while, they made a whole lot, but they brought our country down, and several countries around the world, as you know, are having trouble as well. But these large institutions have enormous power inside of Washington at the U.S. Treasury, on presidential staffs right next to the president, like the chief of staff, uh, the heads of our treasury, regardless of administration. They have their fangs right into uh, the beltway, and they don't, um, they, they don't let up that chokehold. And that's what's going on. Foreclosed Wall Street, not my home. We pay, we own. Foreclosed Wall Street. People on Wall Street do not know the difference between right and wrong. They do not know that it's it's wrong to lie, it's wrong to steal, and then they make a few mistakes. They want us to pay for it. They may give it some window dressing about limiting executive compensation, but the real goal is to transfer huge funds to the investment banks, to the hedge funds, to central banks that created this mess in the first place. This is like one, two, three. One, the Iraq war, 700 billion out of our back pocket. Two, the energy situation. The record profits while we pay for it at the gas tank. And now three, Wall Street, in terms of looking for another $700 billion on top of all that's been done. I'm very concerned about the economic circumstance right now and uh, at the same time trying to understand um, what is happening and what the things that the politicians are trying to do. so much money to uh, bail out the investment companies that have that have made unwise decisions and and created huge losses to their shareholders while they always say they don't have money for things like affordable housing and and more parks and and health care when the financial guys win they win alone and when the uh, financial guys lose. The taxpayer is losing, and that it's not—it's not fair. It's not justice. We need a strong, uh, world-class regulatory agency to oversee the prudential operations of the GSEs. I think we see entities that are fundamentally sound financially.
Americans think, my gosh, you know, Saddam Hussein is about to attack us, or Osama bin Laden in a little cave, you know, in Afghanistan is about to overthrow the government, because politicians and the Defense Department exploit that fear. In the living room that's ignored by both the Republicans and Democrats is the national security budget. This kid lost his father. Uh, look at the pain of war. Look in his eyes. And think about his dad in the coffin right behind him and the little American flag he's got folded. That's the cost of war. The U.S. continues to spend billions of dollars on wars that are uh, not supported by the majority of the American people, partially because there is a industry in the United States that makes money from these wars, the war contractors, the defense industry, and partially because no politician wants to be accused of being soft on security. With the financial crisis the American people are, are facing, uh, that we continue to spend so much money on wars instead of investing in rebuilding America. America. The suicide rate is at a record level among enlisted uh, forces. The divorce rate among the enlisted ranks is more than 80 percent. If you're going to say you support the troops, continuing to send them into this meat grinder in Afghanistan, and even Iraq, we still have troops there, that's really a fallacious argument. Price. Inflation has made it impossible. Again, when I was a kid, it wasn't, you never heard parents saying, we're planning and putting money away for your education because it's going to cost us $100,000 and we have to keep putting that money away so that when you graduate, not only will you not pay us back, you're not even going to get a job. I was so pro-education. That's all I wanted in my life was an education. And, and you know, I'd like to still be pro-education, right. but to put anybody through what I've been through, no. Really, in my case, the education, I think, really ruined my life. Right. So, I mean, I would have been better off if I just would have gone to work at, you know, McDonald's or something. Today, Two-thirds of students are graduating college with an average student loan debt of $24,000. And the government is now making the situation many times worse by completely taking over the student loan business. Hidden inside of the recently passed health care bill, the government passed a complete student loan overhaul where they removed commercial banks from providing loans to students. Now, all students will receive their loans directly from the government at artificially low interest rates. I would love to see a little more activism on, my, on, on the part of my students. I think they have been taking this now for such, such a long time that maybe it's just part of the scenery now and they're not, not really worried about it anymore. And I also think a person that's 20 years old, 22 years old, does not realize the implications of not being able to escape student loan debt. But in its wisdom, a few years ago, as you probably know, Congress changed those rules in that you can no longer discharge student loan debt through bankruptcy. And now, even if you happen to make it to Social Security and you still owe them money, they're going to come after your Social Security check, if it exists, which I don't think it will. Now, now let me tell you what they're talking about. They're, they're complaining about the fact that Wall Street wrecked the economy three years ago, and nobody's held responsible for that. Not a single person has been indicted or convicted. For destroying 20 percent, 20 percent of our national net worth accumulated over the course of two centuries. They're upset about the fact that Wall Street has iron control over the economic policies of this country and that one party is a wholly owned subsidiary of Wall Street and the other party caters to them as well. That's the real truth of the matter, as you said before. But a new capitalism not, not fueled by wars, one that doesn't pass all its wealth to a handful of white guys and call that free trade. Yes. Woo! So I've been around for four decades at one kind of activism or another and 
you know, the, it's always been um, a hope to uh, go after Wall Street and, you know, attack it without uh, getting locked up and uh, beaten up and uh, uh, physically beaten up. And, and how do we win? Oh, yeah. We're not going anywhere Oh, yeah. We're not going the only way that people like us with no power and no money can at least try to change things is through social pressure. I was waiting for this to happen. I knew it would happen because it happened in Europe and I knew it would spread. Wall Street? Oh, my God. What they do to the American people, to our system, completely corrupt, completely responsible for the mess, the recession that we have. A global outcry against corporate greed has risen up in almost a thousand cities worldwide. People have taken their anger to the streets, saying their governments have been taken over by big business. The Occupy Wall Street movement began in New York, quickly spreading across the U.S. to Los Angeles, Denver and Washington, among others. It's since gone global, with Asia joining in the demands for change. In Europe, too, hundreds of cities are taking part in the protests. I'm not here to talk about plans to deal with this till 2017. I'm saying we've got a real problem. We have to deal with the extraction that is at foot. It is the reason the financial markets are behaving the way they're behaving. That is a mathematical fact. 